Hello, and uh, welcome to this second lecture in the Law, Ideology and Human Rights Violations uh, on the Western Legal Tradition and uh, Authoritarian States. This second lecture is on narcissism. As I said in the last lecture, I, I went uh, through, this is a lecture series in four parts. Uh, I went through the Western legal tradition and the dual state in the first lecture. And in this second lecture, we'll look at uh, the development of law when the Nazis took over power in Germany in 1933. But before we go to 1933, let's have a little retrospective look at Germany uh, and the legal law system before the Nazis. Germany was a uh, well-developed legal order uh, for many years before the Nazis, although it was an autocratic rule under the Kaiser before the end of World War I. Uh, the uh, German rule of law state developed through the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries, particularly the 19th century. Uh, and uh, it was a model for many countries, also uh, the Scandinavian countries, uh, that developed their legal orders based on the traditions and the uh, concepts and systems uh, and values of uh, German law. Um, with the fall of the Kaiser, uh, the uh, Weimar Republic was introduced with a constitution that was well advanced, both on the rule of law and individual rights. We know that the uh, Weimar Republic was uh, a republic with a well-developed constitution, uh, but also with a high degree of instability uh, because of the um, economic depression, because of the uh, unrest between the communists and the Nazis. Uh, and uh, uh, after several attempts to uh, govern uh, Germany in 1932 and 1933 and the rise of the Nazi party and the uh, popular vote that gave them uh, more than uh, a third of uh, the votes uh, of the population, the uh, Nazis came to power. The Nazis made a point of coming to power in a legal way. So uh, ostensibly the takeover was legal. Not, uh, Hitler was appointed chancellor by the, the Reich president. Uh, and uh, there were elections after the fire in the uh, Reichstag, where albeit the communists and the social democrats were excluded. Uh, but this Reichstag then was elected and it uh, uh, enacted the uh, uh, emergency and enactment law that gave uh, all power to uh, Hitler as the Reich Chancellor. Now, within these uh, few years, 13 years from 1933 to the end in 1945, uh, there was a complete transition of uh, the German state and uh, the German legal order. Uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the Nazi state, if we look uh, particularly at the uh, legal system and the legal institutions, uh, we see that they uh, one has not the uh, complete count, but more than 35,000 death sentences were um, uh, enacted by the German courts. Uh, in addition to this, uh, disproportionate punishments were meted out, particularly for, uh, uh, for political crimes, but also other crimes. There was a systematic discrimination of Jews and Poles. Jews were... Uh, deprived of uh, their legal rights and uh, after a short while also of their status as legal subjects. They were no longer uh, nationals of uh, Germany, but were deprived of their nationality and deprived of their status as uh, legal subjects. Uh, and when uh, Poland was uh, attacked and occupied by Germany, uh, a specific uh, criminal code uh, towards uh, Jews and Poles were enacted where uh, crimes for which uh, German nationals would be given uh, prison sentences uh, were punishable by death if they were committed by Jews and Poles, as one example. Also, the Nazi justice participated in war crimes. Uh, one of the most notorious uh, uh, forms of participation was the participation in the 
Nacht und Nebel program, which was enacted in the occupied countries in Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, France, and so on, where people opposing the uh, German occupants uh, uh, by different types of resistance uh, were brought to Germany to disappear in the night and fog of the concentration camps. Now, this was a scheme that was um, enforced by the uh, uh, by the legal institutions of Germany, by the prosecutors and by the judges and the courts. And the uh, uh, intent of the Nacht and Nebel program was that all uh, prisoners sent to Germany would be sent there and tried in secrecy uh, to disappear uh, and so that the population of the countries from where they were taken should not uh, receive any knowledge of, uh, of the destiny of the people who had been transposed to Germany. Um, in effect, only a minority of the people uh, who were taken under the Nacht and Nebel were actually sentenced by German courts because of the uh, capacity problems of the German courts. But in the um, uh, Nuremberg uh, trials after the war, this was deemed a war crime and uh, the uh, leaders of the uh, judicial system of uh, Germany were pu punished for uh, war crimes and participating in this. So this is sort of a summing up of the uh, participation of the legal system. Of course, we know of all the atrocities committed by, by the other parts of the, the German uh, state, the Nazi state. Uh, which uh, by far exceeded this, of course, uh, but this is just pointing to uh, the legal institution, the courts, the prosecutors, uh, and the legal order. Uh, the picture here, by the way, is the monument that has been erected uh, outside the uh, German Judges Academy in Trier in memory of uh, uh, the people who uh, uh, became victims of German justice. We see here the uh, sculpture and lying in front of the sculpture is the blade of the guillotine that was used in the execution of many of these uh, uh, death sentences that were enacted by, uh, by the courts. There was, however, as we remember from uh, the last lecture, there was a continuity into this uh, uh, body of atrocity that uh, was committed by the German courts. And we see one of the uh, leading uh, uh, ideologists and also one of the leading constitutional lawyers in Germany at the time, both uh, in the Weimar Republic and in the beginning of the Nazi time, Karl Schmidt. Uh, he, his view here represents the uh, uh, sentiment of many of the leading German legal academics at the time. Uh, where he uh, expressed that to maintain views that are extraneous or hostile to the dominant national socialist worldview of the German people would be subjective and arbitrary and be an attack on the undertaking of the national socialist state. As such, it would disturb and threaten judicial independence and the boundedness of the judges to the law. So we see this in a way perversion of the notion of judicial independence and the boundedness of the judges to the law where the Nazi party ideology became, so to say, the leading uh, source of law uh, and the leading and objective uh, focus point that would form the transition of the legal order uh, and, and the legal rulings from the rule of law state of the Weimar Republic into uh, the uh, Nazi legal order of oppression. Uh, but we also see, and it's interesting no to note, that the uh, ideology of judicial independence and the boundedness of the judges to the law, which are central to uh, uh, the rule of law state, are used and appealed to by Karl Schmidt. So we see here also the uh, continuity of the ideology of the West Western legal tradition into uh, the national socialist state, the Nazi state. Uh, and they uh, perceived themselves as a rule of law state, but it was not a liberal rule of law state, but a national socialist rule of law state. So there was a transformation of the legal order and the legal ideology uh, with some, uh, some important dominant traits. The first one which I mentioned was the transition from the liberal to a national socialist rule of law. They did not perceive themselves as breaking with the tradition of the rule of law, 
what they said was that the introduction of the liberal ideology was a perversion of the traditional rule of law of Germany. It was an import from France, it was an import from uh, Roman law, uh, and it was hostile to Germanic rule of law, which was then uh, restituted by the National Socialist rule of law. Also, the National Socialist state was a Führer state. Uh, this meant that Hitler, uh, as the future Führer, was the supreme judge and legislator. So there was a combination and a joining of the legislative and the judicial, judicial authority in the person of Hitler as, uh, as the prime judge and prime legislator. And Hitler's views were in this way also uh, the prime uh, source of law, uh, above all other sources of law, above legislation, above court rulings, uh, and so on. Uh, but this was very much at the level of ideology because in actual effect, Hitler did not uh, occupy himself much with the dealings of the legal system. And he only to a, a small extent intervened into the workings of the law and the legislation and the judiciary. So uh, Hitler was sort of recognized as the supreme judge, as the prime source of law, but in practice, this did not uh, matter very much to the day-to-day -day dealings of the legal order. What was important though, was the change of uh, ideology, putting the common good above the individual interest. Uh, one of the dictas of the uh, National Socialist uh, legal theorists was that there was no contradiction between the interests of the individual and the interests of the state, because the individuals were uh, subordinate to the state and the interests of the individuals were subordinate to the interests of the state. So the common good uh, must be placed above the individual interest and the individuals who opposed to that were no longer uh, protecting their individual subjective rights but they became very quickly enemies of the state and as enemies of the state they were subject to the force of the law. Now what was the common good? Within the National Socialist ideology, the common good was the protection of the German folk and blood, the protection of the German people uh, uh, and the German uh, common, uh, commonness, so to say. This was a mythical um, thing that was um, identified with a, a mythical view of German and Germanic history, but it was also a racial thing where law then was defined in relation to race and people, to folk. And the law was then in Germany, was transformed to being the law of the land of Germany, to being the law of the people of Germany. Uh, and one of the main objects of the law was to protect the German people. And this introduced then the racial element within, uh, within Nazi law, because defining law in this way meant that uh, people who did not belong to the German folk were no longer subjects or protected by uh, German law. Uh, on the contrary, German law's main purpose was to protect the German people against alien people, namely the Jews. Uh, and in this way, uh, the uh, racial part and the anti-Semitic part of German law was uh, inherent and a necessary part of Nazi law as it was defined. Uh, and uh, other people, particularly people who were enemies of the German people, read the Jews, were then subject to the force of the law and the law's main uh, purpose was to protect against these enemies of the German people. Also, um, a, an important trait of the uh, transition of the legal ideology was within criminal law and the reforms of the criminal code was a transition from attention to the criminal act that we find important also uh, in our criminal systems today to combating the criminal mind. Uh, this must be seen in relation to what I said about the common good about the individual in above the individual interest because people committing criminal acts were placing themselves uh, in, uh, as enemies of the German people. Uh, and uh, if they were sort of racially part of the German people, uh, 
this must then be uh, a, an effect of their having uh, the wrong mind, the criminal mind. So the purpose of uh, the uh, uh, criminal law was to combat this criminal mind. Uh, Jews were by definition and by nature antisocial and had criminal minds, so to say, so they were beyond hope. Uh, but people of the German race uh, could be saved uh, if their minds were changed. And if they were unsavable, then they were left outside of the ambit of the law and left to the uh, SS and the concentration camps. Uh, but this was then an important part and an important task of criminal law was to educate and to combat the criminal mind. Uh, finally, I would like to point to the transition from a legal formalist uh, approach to law to what they call the sound folkish interpretation, a sound interpretation based on the recognition of the, gene, the German people, as expressed by the Führer, as expressed by the National Socialist uh, Party program, and as expressed by the National Socialist ideology. Uh, this emphasis on the sound folkish interpretation was the mechanism by which uh, the, uh, uh, the lawyers, the legal academics and the judges could reinterpret uh, vast amounts of uh, German legislation and uh, uh, put it in, into the workings of uh, uh, and the interests of the National Socialist State. So, so law was transformed not so much by legislation. The BGB, the, uh, the code, the civil code was left in place. As I said, there were reforms of the criminal code. The procedure was uh, in many ways left in place. Uh, specialist, special courts were established to deal with, uh, with, with, with uh, political crimes. Uh, uh, the military legal system was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, reinforced uh, and uh, uh, and used in, uh, in, in many uh, places, a, even an SS legal uh, order and legal institutions were established, uh, but based on the old laws from the Kaiser time and from the uh, Weimar Republic, uh, but they were reinterpreted uh, to fit to the sound folkish interpretation. So this was uh, a basic mechanism of, uh, of uh, uh, of the legal, uh, the workings of the legal institutions. Uh, the approach to law, the legal methodology, and the legal sources were not that different from uh, the legal methodology of uh, the Weimar Republic, and even not that different from the legal methodology of the post-war times. There has been studies into the, uh, uh, into the legal methodology of the Nazis, uh, and we can see that the lawyers uh, approach this in ways that are familiar also to us as lawyers today. Uh, but there are sort of changes, as I said, in emphasis, uh, less change on formalism, less, less emphasis on formalism, less emphasis on the letter of the law, more emphasis on the purpose of the law. But we elaborate today also with the dialectics between the, uh, the wording of the law and the purpose of the law. So this is nothing that is unfamiliar to, to lawyers in other settings. Um, uh, the emphasis on, on the law as a protection of the people, uh, but we also see that the law, the war on drugs, the war on terror and so on, the law even in our uh, settings is used uh, to protect entities that uh, are regarded as uh, part of the law. So, so all these traits are familiar, and they represent continu continuity, both into the Nazi system and out of the Nazi system, but taken together, uh, they uh, made it possible then uh, to transform the law, to fit the um, op oppression and atrocities of the Nazi state. Who were the judges? Uh, the judges were more or less taken over uh, from uh, the Weimar Republic. There was no uh, systematic purge of the judiciary when the Nazis took over power. Um, the uh, Jews, the, the judges with Jewish origin were dismissed, and also judges who were deemed as uh, politically unreliable, that is, communists and uh, social democrats. But the vast majority of judges did not fit into these categories. 
Uh, so most of the judiciary were kept in place. The Nazis had to recruit new judges uh, because of the expanse of the legal activities and uh, with the expanse of the German Reich. Um, but the, these judges were educated in the legal institutions, in the traditional legal universities, albeit with uh, uh, also high influence of uh, uh, training of the minds in, in, uh, in the Nazi ideology. Uh, but the judges were recruited on the basis of merit, not on the basis of uh, political, uh, uh, political preferences. Uh, and this uh, continued throughout the, uh, throughout the Nazi time. Uh, the leading judges, the court presidents, were uh, uh, politically appointed. And as I said, special courts were established to deal with political crimes the notorious Volksgerichtshof, uh, the People's Court in Berlin, where this is one of the presidents, Roland Preisler, uh, of the People's Court, and the special courts. Here, judges were recruited that were politically reliable. Uh, and this may, uh, Roland Preisler here, is maybe the picture that most of us have of the judges of the Nazi time. Uh, bone-faced ideologists, uh, leading proceedings that uh, were um, a scam compared to uh, uh, normal legal proceedings. Uh, you can see if you Google Roland Freisler and looking up, on, looking up on YouTube, you can see uh, films of uh, the political trials that he uh, uh, presided over after the attempt to assassinate Hitler in July 1944. Uh, but this is a false picture when we look at the, uh, uh, the vast majority of the German judges uh, during Nazi time. Uh, and we have different uh, measures that can show this. One is uh, the uh, uh, accounts given by lawyers who were practicing lawyers for these courts and their courts. Uh, I, I mentioned, uh, I mentioned uh, Ernst Frenkel and the dual state and his descriptions. Uh, also from my country, there are um, accounts by Norwegian lawyers uh, who were pleading before the German courts in, in trials against uh, Norwegian members of the Norwegian opposition. Who in their accounts after the war, uh, wrote that uh, the judges uh, at the proceedings were familiar to them uh, because of their experiences from uh, Norwegian courts uh, before the war and, uh, uh, and also normal Norwegian courts during the war. So, uh, the judges were not that different from, uh, from uh, normal judges, so to say. Uh, and another proof of this is that when uh, uh, the Federal Republic of Germany was built up and its legal system was built up after the, uh, after the war and after the fall of the Nazi state, most of the judges filling the judiciary of the Federal Republic of Germany were taken over. Uh, from the Nazi time. And even as late as in the 1960s, two thirds of the judges in the Federal Republic of Germany had served as judges during the Nazi, the, the Nazi rule. So we see at the level of uh, personnel, uh, there was a continuity both into the Nazi legal system and out from the Nazi legal system into uh, the uh, uh, constitutional uh, rule of law state of uh, the Federal Republic of Germany. So how could this happen? How could the, uh, the highly regarded uh, German legal order, uh, led by well-known figures as, uh, uh, who have, uh, of legal theory, how could this transform into the perversion of a legal order uh, by uh, by these uh, figures, Schmidt, Freisler, Stuckart, Frank, and others. Uh, how could they sort of, in their minds, substitute the great minds of Savigny, Yearing, Jelinek, and Radbrook? Well, we have to look into a variety of explanations to, uh, to, to explain this. One is the uh, oppressiveness of the Nazi state that came in suddenly with the oppression in 1933, um, influencing and, uh, um, and oppressing public opinion with harassment, terror, legal scholarship, uh, and a, a wide variety of measures. In 1933, after the Nazi takeover of power, the communists and the social democrats were prohibited by law. 
And uh, the concentration camps were established and thousands, tens of thousands of people were dragged into the concentration camps. Uh, the court buildings were attacked by uh, SA paramilitary groups who trampled into the court buildings uh, and uh, attacked all members uh, of the courts and all the uh, lawyers uh, there of a Jewish origin, throwing them out by physical force, uh, force exerting, of course, uh, terror and fright into the others. Uh, so this uh, element of fright and terror pacified, I think, uh, the population and also the judiciary and the legal institutions. Uh, it, uh, it put them in a, a state of mind where opposition became dangerous and maybe unthinkable. Uh, but this also uh, was followed up by legal techniques, as I said. Uh, one was uh, a limitation of jurisdiction. Uh, we also see this in, uh, in present day. I've, I've taken a citation by uh, the European Court of Human Rights in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, how, how the uh, Ukrainian courts have uh, or, or refused to look into the uh, uh, workings of the prosecutors and the police in, in uh, unrestful times in Ukraine. The same happened in, in, in Nazi Germany quite early. And there, this was the development of the prerogative state, as I said, which developed uh, in the first stages by legislation and legislations on the Gestapo, where um, the Gestapo was established and legislation was enacted which excluded the Gestapo from the jurisdiction of the courts. And this was accepted by, by the courts. Uh, there was some protests by some courts uh, initially, uh, but they were uh, quickly pacified. Uh, and it meant that the courts accepted that they had to uh, yield to the prerogative state uh, by, uh, by legal reasoning. Uh, this is uh, the same that happened also in South Africa and Chile that I mentioned uh, in my uh, previous lecture. Uh, so this is an important part that the courts accept that they yield jurisdiction to the prerogative state. They accept uh, that they do not have jurisdictions over actions by the executive. We know this from our own legal system that the executive uh, has some power which is not uh, subject to judicial review. So it's using this type of legal techniques to, to give power to the, the executive that is then expanded into uh, huge areas of oppression uh, that are allowed to develop outside the uh, ambit of the courts. Another part of it is the application of any law disregarding the content of the law. Uh, this is a highly positivist or submissive uh, approach to law by the judges uh, and uh, transforming uh, what we today see as uh, uh, hugely, hugely uh, atrocious uh, pieces of legislation, accepting this as technical legal matters. Uh, if we look at the, uh, the uh, racial laws of Nuremberg defining uh, the, the, uh, the division between the Aryan people and the Jewish people in this law to protect the German blood and the German honor that it was called that was enacted in Nuremberg uh, in 1935 and that was copied also in other countries like Italy, France, uh, the Netherlands, Norway uh, and also uh, in some ways in, in Sweden even though Sweden was outside of the uh, uh, German uh, occupation. Uh, also, Swedish courts had to apply this in, um, in issues of um, international private law, where uh, conflicts over property in Germany came uh, with the uh, influx of, uh, of uh, Jewish refugees. And we see that uh, it's a common uh, trait in many of these jurisdictions that when faced with this type of law, uh, the judges and the uh, legal academics uh, stop questioning the uh, moral parts of this and stop questioning the relationship between this and the higher uh, uh, norms and, uh, and values of equality before the law uh, and uh, legal uh, 
sovereignty and, uh, uh, and legal values and start dealing with this as purely technical legal matters, matters of interpretation. Uh, how does one uh, distinguish between uh, and how does one draw the line according to this legislation between a person who is uh, recognized as Jewish and who is recognized as, uh, as Aryan? Uh, what standards of proof shall one apply? What is counted as evidence for Jewishness or evidence for as Aryanness uh, and so on? So, so this application of any law without questioning the uh, underlying moral uh, or ideological content uh, is also a way then of uh, opening for the uh, uh, enactment of oppressive legislation. A, a third uh, explanation, a third legal technique is the reinterpretation of law to adapt it to the new circumstances. Uh, as I said, one of the techniques was, or what one, one of the changes in emphasis was from the letter of the law uh, to uh, the Germanish, German folkish uh, interests. Uh, one uh, notorious example is a, a reinterpretation in contract law. Uh, this is from a, a contract uh, uh, for, between a producer and a director uh, of a film making the film The Homecoming of Ulysses, which was, uh, the contract was uh, entered into in 1932, and one of the most famous uh, film directors in Germany uh, was entrusted with uh, the task of uh, producing or directing this film. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, it turned out that uh, the film would be impossible to uh, uh, commercialize in Germany after 1933, because this director was a Jew. Uh, and in the contract, uh, there was a clause giving uh, the right for the, uh, uh, the, the producer here to uh, uh, revoke the contract if the director became unable to perform his uh, part of the contract in, in an event of uh, death or serious illness. Uh, now, the question was whether this clause then would give uh, the uh, producer the right to revoke the contract. And this contract came all the way up to... Uh, uh, the Supreme Court of the Reichsgericht in uh, Germany in 1936. Uh, and uh, by elaborate legal reasoning and by going through the change in status of uh, Jews in Germany from 1933 to 1936, the clause uh, stating that uh, the, director, the director was unable to perform his part of the contract due to death or serious illness was interpreted to apply to uh, the specific case because the Jews, the, the court said that Jews by any practical legal measure in Germany today, uh, when looking at their legal status must be, uh, must be seen as equal uh, to being deceased, to being dead. So, so the contract could then be, the clause could then be uh, invoked in favor of the producer. Now this was quite, this is quite sinister if we uh, if we then, with hindsight, know what happened to the Jews just a few years after 1936. But, but uh, it's also quite sinister to know that four years before the Holocaust was uh, uh, physically uh, started, the German Reichsgericht had pronounced the Jews as equal to dead uh, within uh, German law. Um, this is one uh, example which is, uh, which is particularly uh, showing that, but the, the whole uh, whole bodies of law were reinterpreted. Contract law was reinterpreted so that Jews were deprived of contractual rights. Labor law was reinterpreted so they were deprived of labor rights. Um, landlord and tenant law was reinterpreted so they could be evicted from their, uh, uh, from their apartments and so on and so on. Uh, and the whole legal order was then transformed. Now, many of the uh, lawyers after the war, they uh, excused themselves saying that we were only upholding the law as it changed. We were legal positivists. We were, um, uh, we were educated in legal positivism before the law. Uh, and because we were educated in legal positivism, we were defenseless when the positive law changed. So when the Nazis changed the law, uh, then uh, uh, we could no longer defend ourselves. We, we had no choice. We had to uphold the law. That's the rule of law. It's uh, the positive uh, approach to law that uh, uh, we were educated in. Uh, later research has shown that uh, 
uh, this uh, was uh, is not an explanation of what happened. Uh, first of all, positivism was not the dominant legal ideology in Germany before 1933. It was an important part of uh, uh, of legal theory, but was by, by no means the sole uh, and dominant uh, legal theory. So there were discussions in legal theory on what approach to take to law. Uh, and we also see that positivism cannot explain the reinterpretation of law that took part uh, by the judges and by the legal academics uh, from 1933. It was highly unpositivistic to reinterpret the bodies of law that I mentioned. Uh, this has nothing to do with uh, positivism as we know it or as uh, they knew it uh, before 1933. Uh, rather, one can say it was a, a, a hugely instrumentalist approach to law that was used. Uh, instrumentalist in the way that law was adapted uh, and transformed to, to uh, uh, perform the tasks of uh, the Nazi state. Uh, and the judges were then uh, uh, main actors in instrumentalizing law uh, to be able to uh, to uh, obtain the goals and the aims of uh, the Nazi state. So this is the bleak picture uh, uh, and a brief overview of uh, the transition that the German legal uh, system and legal institutions went through very quickly after the Nazi takeover of power. Uh, but it's important to say that even though uh, law was transformed in this way, it was still law. Uh, many uh, have said within legal uh, theory after the war have uh, disclaimed the notion of law from the Nazi legal system and said that this was so horrible, this was so immoral, uh, that it can no longer be regarded as law. And it's true, some parts, some important parts of uh, the legislation and the law as it was understood in the Nazi time, was highly immoral, uh, but many parts of it, regulating the, the normal day-to-day -day commercial affairs and criminal affairs, was very much business as usual. Also, as Frankel showed in his uh, uh, book on the dual state. And if we look at the level of the institutions, uh, there was a continu continuity in the personnel. It was the same people applying the door, uh, before the Nazi takeover and after the Nazi takeover. Uh, although the judges were uh, uh, subject to uh, criticism and uh, uh, harassment, uh, there was in some way an upholding of judicial independence. There was no direct interference or little direct interference into the individual uh, rulings and the individual um, uh, cases, uh, the managing of the cases, uh, the uh, evaluation of evidence and interpretation of the law. Uh, and the legal reasoning was still reasoning by established legal methods and the continuity, as I said, in, uh, in legal reasoning, there were changes in emphasis and so on, but the methodology and the approach was the same. And political trials were held within Germany uh, to a, a large extent, but to a little extent, uh, what can be labeled as show trials. I'll go into the notion and the concept of show trials in the next lecture when we speak about the Soviet legal system and you'll see the differences there. Uh, and if we look at the uh, procedures for the courts, there was an adherence to basic legal procedure uh, judged by the international standards of the time. Uh, we must remember when we look at this time with our uh, viewpoint today, uh, there has been a huge development in the standards that we require of our courts, particularly in, in the past uh, two or three decades. Uh, but if we look at the, uh, the legal standards, particularly during uh, times of crisis and times of war, uh, in other countries in the 1930s and the 1940s, we will see that the uh, basic legal procedures that were applied by the German courts were not that different from the basic legal procedures uh, applied by, by, by courts in, in other countries. And also after the war in the so-called justice trials, uh, the American uh, judges in uh, these trials by the American military tribunals showed a high degree of understanding and sympathy uh, with their German colleagues during the uh, 
in the Nazi time. Uh, the reason why there is uh, this continuity, I think, is can be explained and can only be explained by the uh, uh, legacy of history and the notion of path dependence. Uh, as I said, uh, Germany is part of the Western legal tradition and has been a, an important uh, center of the, Germ of the Western legal tradition for centuries. Uh, and the Western legal traditions, as I explained in the first lecture, is many centuries old. Uh, and there is a path dependence, both in the norms and in the incentives and resources that are put into uh, the legal order. The, German, the, the Nazis did not abolish the legal system because it would have been very costly for them to abolish the legal system. They would have had to establish new institutions to perform similar tasks. Uh, and uh, the notion of judicial independence was so ingrained in, in the German legal mind that it was in, unthinkable for them uh, to think of a judge being instructed by a party functionary. It was a contradiction in terms. Uh, so uh, one could not um, at the same time imagine uh, a court, a court of law, and a political tribunal as they saw them in, 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 in the Soviet Union. And the power relations, uh, one can see how the Ministry of uh, Justice, the, the Nazi state was not a, 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 a unitary, it was not the unitary dominated state uh, as, uh, as many imagine. It, it was a state with many, uh, many uh, uh, centers of power and with conflict between party, between uh, the uh, civil service, between different parts of the civil service and so on. And uh, the uh, power relations between the judiciary, the Ministry of Justice, uh, and so on, uh, contributed to protect the integrity of the legal order, and this way then also protect the continuity that was, the measure of continuity that uh, actually was. So to sum up, uh, there was both a break and a continuity uh, going into the Nazi legal system. Uh, the normative state was limited in its jurisdiction, uh, but it continued within the limits. So in this way, uh, Frenkel's theory on the dual state fits very well to what we now later also know about the uh, uh, Nazi uh, state and its relation to the legal institutions and the legal system. But also there are pictures of the, uh, or there are elements of what happened uh, that do not fit so well with Frankel's theory of the dual state. Uh, law was transformed in substance to a huge extent, particularly when regarding uh, the Jews. So, so this was a break in uh, continuity uh, and uh, the courts participated also in the illegality. Uh, the courts did not uh, refrain from engaging in illegal activities in support of the state. Uh, so they didn't follow the law. The normative state did not totally uh, govern uh, the actions of the legal institutions. However, law did resist. Uh, Frankel was right. And there was also some sort of normativity within the prerogative state. The SS established its own legal institutions uh, and the dealings within the concentration camps were governed ostensibly by norms. These norms were to a large extent broken, of course, but there was a type of normativity even within the prerogative state, which Frankel then did not uh, see or did not catch in his observation within the course of law and therefore did not include in his theory of uh, the dual state. Well, this concludes then the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, this concludes the uh, uh, second lecture on uh, the uh, uh, Nazi legal state. Uh, next time we will look at the uh, uh, communist uh, revolution in the Soviet Union and its relation to the law and compare this to the Nazis. So I thank you all for the attention this time. Thank you.